The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. Let's connect you with Senator David Sutterline. Good to see you, sir. Good to be here. And Senator Bill Stanley, good to see you again. It's always sir. great to see you, Woody. Now, I know there was a meeting regarding the New College Institute uh, this week. Uh, tell us uh, the status of the New College Institute. Well, about a month ago, I was elected by the Board of Directors, of which I've sat on for four years to be the Chairman of the Board. We've had some great progress since it opened 13 years ago, but in that time, uh, we've grown a little stagnant. We need to change our model. You know, it, when this concept came about in 16 years ago, Online education wasn't where it is today. So delivering classes and degrees from our other institutions like UVA, VCU, into the bricks and mortar building of New College uh, was a unique idea. Well, now uh, people can roll out of their bed, stay in their jammies, and get a master's degree. So we have to kind of be nimble and forward thinking, and that's what we've been doing. We've been redeveloping through the board of directors our new path for New College. And so uh, we had a board meeting here in Richmond. Uh, we set uh, pretty much goals for ourselves and also a strategic path, which includes narrowing our focus in what we offer. There are many colleges in Virginia that offer a la carte. If you want a French degree or a history degree, those are out there. And, and quite frankly, we're trying to build a workforce to bring not only companies in, but put our people back to work in advanced manufacturing in the trades. So what we're going to focus on is what we call the plus two. We've got two great community colleges in Danville Community College and Patrick Henry Community College. And they offer two-year associate's degree, especially in engineering, uh, applied sciences, and now cyber, uh, cyber security. Patrick Henry and Danville are both doing that. So we want to be the plus two on that to, to provide the four-year baccalaureate finished degree for advanced manufacturing, for cyber security. And so we can bring that student in and also create a pipeline for those companies once they graduate. Another thing that we want to add is the experiential learning component, which is if we have a student come in with that associate's degree from our sister community colleges, we're going to have partner them up with one of the participating corporations in the local area so that they have a job. They get paid. We're going to make sure our tuition is low. And it's kind of a finishing school and a baccalaureate program, but by the time they graduate, they're probably going to be hired by that company that they've worked for for two years in a position that's going to pay them sixty, seventy thousand. So we're excited. I'm excited. It's a lot of uh, hard work that has to be done, but I've got a great board of directors uh, and I'm very excited about the possibilities in the future of New College. In and Morrisville. of course, uh, I believe Danville Community College was recently recognized in terms of cybersecurity. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, the governor just made that announcement. The two-year program that we're putting in down there for cybersecurity, Patrick Henry's developing that program as well. And that, I think, is a cutting-edge job that in the marketplace right now is in demand. You're talking about, from what the governor even estimates, 30,000 positions remain in Virginia unfilled. We have to fill those positions. And so why not make Danville Community College, why not make Patrick Henry and New College the centerpiece for, for educating people in that new technology, in that new field, which once they graduate, they're going to be making 60, 70, 80, 90,000. We have to focus and be nimble and be able to pivot to be able to provide programs that are job-ready programs. That is to say, when somebody graduates, like from New College, if they go and get the engineering, advanced manufacturing, finishing degree from us, in that degree they're going to have embedded certification and credential programs that are going to make them 100% hireable. And that's what we have to do. You know, nobody right now in, in big business and the businesses we're trying to attract uh, wants to hire somebody with a history degree. I'm an English major, so you know it didn't leave a lot of options for me when I graduated so long ago. Uh, he was just a little kid when that happened. <laughs> but you know we have to be we have to be nimble, as I said, and offer something that's going to put our people and put Southside back to work. And we think we're on the right path. And Senator Sutherland, we know that uh, education is one of your big passions. You're a member of the Education and Health Committee in, in the Senate. Talk to us about uh, the the education needs in your district. Well, one. In my district, in Senator Stanley's district, one of the most important things is the state's investment in it. 
Uh, some folks in other parts of the state try to change the formula by which it funds, and that's something that we've worked very hard to resist. Is that that local composite index? That's exactly what it is, and it's how much a state will put in versus how much localities put in. We've made sure that the Commonwealth is significantly investing in education in our part of the Commonwealth. Uh, also, we've been working on assessment reform in the Senate Education Health Committee. Uh, the SOLs were a great thing. Standards of learning. Standards of learning exams were a great thing in the early 90s. Um, and one of the problems is the idea was always, they're good, let's add more tests. And at the same time, a lot of our educators want several diagnostic tests and it's one standardized test after another. When you talk to parents, they sort of think of all of them as SOLs because that's what their kids think of them all as. Um, two years ago, we made progress in removing the third grade science and social studies SOL exams uh, with the thinking being we really need to focus on math and reading because you're not going to have a very good understanding of social studies if you can't comprehend what mm -hmm. you're reading or you're not going to be able to share your views on these things if you're not able to articulate. So we, we focused very much on the language arts there. And also science at that part uh, is still very early and you need to make sure you have the mathematical foundation so you can do more advanced um, advanced science later. Uh, and so with that, this year I have a bill that would make it so instead of doing standardized learning tests for students that have already shown they can pass the PSATs with high scores, we can move to that and some other forms of assessment and hopefully reduce the amount of exams, they, redundant exams they take and allow more time for actual instructing of getting these kids even further advanced along the way. And of course you've got some real life experience in terms of those standards of learning tests because you were subject to them when you were in school, were you not? Yeah, I, I took the standards of learning exams. <laughs> Uh, talk to us a little bit more about some, some other legislation you have dealing with when the school districts in your uh, district can, can open. Yeah, so um, that's something we talked a little bit about earlier is community colleges. And we've got great programs that allow students to dual enroll while they're still in high school in a community college. For some students that will mean dual enrolling for uh, workforce credentials. Others it will be getting down that path so they can start earlier in the two years of, of college for the later four-year degree. Uh, either way, it's a great thing for these students to get ahead of the game. And the community colleges start in August, and we'd like our local school divisions to be able to choose when to start. And it'd still be their decision, but in my district, a lot of them would choose to continue starting in August <coughs> so they can do that program of the dual enrollment. So right now, the law prohibits them from opening before Labor Day unless they're granted an exception. Yeah, so every year they have to check and see if they still have an exemption. And this is what deals with snow days. So just yesterday, uh, some of the localities in my district had a snow day. Some people questioned, you know, should it be a snow day, should it not be? Well, one of the factors that they're not thinking about is the school division needs to think, can we get an exemption? Uh, by having another snow day because it's based on how many snow days you get. And we shouldn't be making decisions about if school starts uh, based on what interest in the eastern part of the state want. It should be on the local school board and we can have that debate locally. Is it better to start in August? Is it better to start in September? When in August do we want to start? And that can be debated in school board elections, not by you know lobbyists from the eastern part of the case state. Uh, Senator, uh, pretend I'm a tourist and I want to come to your district. Where should I go and what should I see? Oh, he's well, going to tell you to come to my district. <laughs> well, I probably would tell you to come to my district first. I mean, there is so much to do, you know, from the Blue Ridge Mountains all the way uh, east. I represent uh, Galax to Halifax and everything in between. Sometimes we think we represent a little bit of North Carolina, too, the way they drew yeah. the maps uh, years ago. But uh, the first thing I'd say is, you know, you need to go to the Fiddler's Convention. You need to come to the beautiful city of Galax and see... Uh, how uh, it is right at the foot of you know the coal fields and so there you move eastward into Patrick County where we have beautiful rolling mountains and we have wonderful people and then Primland Resort is right there a five-star Condé Nast resort uh, that you can do anything that you want in this beautiful pristine na natural setting from there you'd, uh, you'd move into Franklin County there's Smith Mountain Lake the town of Rocky Mountain we have mm -hmm. the harvest the harvester uh, 
a pavilion where we have great bands that come and play. A lot, a lot of major acts are coming there. Yep, and we have the Smith River and, and Patrick and, and, and Henry County. Uh, then you need to ma finish up your tour by going to Martinsville and see a NASCAR race at the Martinsville mm. Speedway, the thing we call the paperclip. Move east into Danville, go to VIR and see a, a road track racing uh, thing. Historical downtown Danville right there at the waterfront has been restored. It looks so wonderful. And then you move into South Boston and you've got some of the best restaurants and uh, best things to do, great shopping. So I could tour. I could bring you on a tour. You just uh, pack your bags and let me know when you want to go. Let's hear from you about You're definitely going to want to come to Smith Mountain Lake. Uh, he mentioned the harvester there in downtown Rocky Mountain, right there in the middle of it. Um, it's a great small town with really major acts that are coming there uh, every month. It's, it's been really great. Smith Mountain Lake, over 500 miles of shoreline. Um, it's amazing how many views. I mean, with that much, every, every time I visit a friend's house that I haven't been to before, I'm amazed at just another great view of the lake. Um, it's a really great place to be. You also have, in my district, Floyd County. Uh, Friday nights, that's where the statewide candidates' uh, favorite place to go. You get to meet lots of folks enjoying uh, traditional music, and it's, it's a good time there in downtown Floyd. We also have some great restaurants there as well. And of course, I also love the city of Salem. You can watch lots of great sports there. Uh, I had the opportunity this year to show my children on opening day. They got to watch some players play there that in August we then saw playing in Baltimore for the Boston Red Sox. Oh, nice. So in mm -hmm. one season they made it all the way uh, from there. You really get to see future Major League stars right there in Salem. You've got some interesting legislation dealing with beer and breweries. I do. Uh, in 2012, myself and Senator McWaters uh, created some legislation that would allow craft brewery houses to be treated like wineries. You know, wineries have tasting rooms and they can serve their alcohol without having to, to abide by the 50-50 food minimums required by the Alcohol, mm -hmm. Beverage, and Control Board. Laws that we've had for a long time. Restaurants have to do it. If they serve alcohol, they have to serve food with it. You can't just have a, a straight bar without food. Um, but that hindered the business growth and that hindered their ability to sell their products. So we put in a bill that allowed that in 2012 to be treated like wineries. Well, what we saw was an explosion of this industry. I mean, if, if you look around, there's a new craft brewery house going up almost every day. And it's not just in one area. We have many here in Richmond. We've got them down in Southside and Southwest Virginia. We've got a great one in Danville. Uh, we've got them coming into Rona. Duchetti's beer is there. And then, so how do we then keep the growth? Because when I talked to these craft brewery owners, they said the one big problem was is that they're behind InBev, Miller Coors, Anheuser-Busch in buying the ingredients to make their product. Most of that's made out west, and those are sold on futures. Uh, so they were getting what was left or the futures that those that, that bought them up first didn't use, and usually it was at a higher cost or a lower quality. So what I thought was, was why don't we make Virginia the Napa Valley of beer? And that is to encourage our farmers to grow the, the hops, the, the malt barley, the wheat, the winter wheat and the spring wheat, those ingredients that they can grow naturally and, and really well here in Virginia, and then sell them to our craft brewery houses or our, any brewery that operates in Virginia. In doing so, creating a marriage between agriculture and also this exploding industry in Virginia. And when you make that transaction, that farmer sells that, that, those hops to that craft brewery house, that to the farmer, it's a tax-free event. That is that encouraging them, because we don't have that kind of industry now, to grow those crops because they won't be taxed by the state when they grow them and then they sell them. So I think it's a great way to invigorate a new agribusiness, and especially one that would, would be married up with a business that already right now has seen explosive growth. Thousands of new jobs, millions in, in revenues, uh, not only for those businesses, but in tax revenues for the localities in the state. I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, I introduced it last year, and, and someone told me, well, that's a novel idea, which meant it had no chance of passing right. last year. But we really worked on it over the summer. We came back and it sailed right out of finance, uh, unanimously sailed right through the floor. It's onto the House and I expect it to pass this year and be signed by the governor. I don't think may, many people understand how significant a revenue producer uh, agribusiness and uh, forestry is in, in the Commonwealth. I assume that's the same in, in, in your district as it's well. It's even more so in my district than the Commonwealth as a whole. Um, with County, Franklin County, Floyd County, Bedford County, Carroll County, uh, which we also share, mm -hmm. uh, all have significant agriculture um, businesses throughout the counties. 
and is a tremendous uh, part of our local economy. Uh, talk to us about the AFID fund that you were instrumental in creating. Yes, uh, years ago, I think in my second year here in the General Assembly, uh, I was in a small business work group that Governor McDonald had put together to try to find ideas where we can encourage business. Part of what we talked about, uh, and Secretary Jim Chang at the time, we were in that work group, and we said, well, we've got this Governor Opportunity Fund, which uses state money to encourage businesses to come, put down roots, invest millions of dollars, and hire our Virginia workers. Well, what, what are we doing for the farmers? And so from that, we came up with the AFID bill, the Agriculture, Forestry, Industrial Development Bill, which then brings state money down for the processing of what is grown in Virginia. And so that helps the farmer and it also helps the locality because with those grants, the locality gets involved. What we're doing is we're now creating a processing plant which then processes the product, the raw product, and makes it ready for market. By way of example, we have a great thing in, 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 uh, in Franklin County called the Homestead Creamery. You may see it on your shelves. It's now a statewide product. Mm -hmm. It's even going into other states. Well, that was a, an, a small idea. Mike Grissetti came up with a great idea of using our dairy uh, industry locally and turning it into a great product, ice cream, milk, custard, the like. And so from that, he wanted to do processing. So one of the first grants from AFID came down and created a processing plant and expanded his processing plant that he had that allowed him to hire more Virginians, that allowed him to get more product to market, that generated more revenue for his business, more revenue for the state and localities. So it is proven uh, a winner. And I think when David talks about the importance of agriculture in our area, if you think about it, Woody, we used to have the highest per capita number of millionaires. We had the highest income 30 years ago. We had the lowest unemployment rates. Right now, the average per capita family of four income in our area is 28,600. 28,000. And where, where the state's average is 63,000. Mm -hmm. Now think about what a, what a change that has been. When, the, when NAFTA and CAFTA took our jobs away and sent our manufacturing tobacco and textile jobs overseas, if it wasn't for agriculture and forestry that, that employs thousands of people, creates billions of dollars in revenues, we would have been destitute. So we owe it to our local farmer uh, for keeping us uh, uh, right at the water level. And it will help us grow as we, as we retool our economy and become once again the economic driver in Virginia. So we can't say enough for the farmer. And I know David and I believe that any time that we can help our small family farmer, we're going to do it. And, and apparently the marketing arm of the state, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, hasn't done a great job. There was a scathing report recently from, from Jay Lark, and there's some reforms that are going to have to be instituted. On several economic development, yeah, we've had several issues with that. I mean, that's one of the things that we debate a lot is, do we want it coming out of Richmond, or would we prefer it to be l more locally, regionally driven? Um, you know, when Richmond's doing it, are they likely going to be promoting Southwest or Southside in the way that Senator Stanley and I think they ought to? Or are they going to continue going after Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads? Um, it's a very big difference on how we view economic development. Uh, one of the things we also believe strongly in is we're about developing as much locally and growing it. And when you, when you follow some of these programs where you keep trying to land really big companies, it, you know, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a Chinese company that doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. uh, which the McAuliffe administration just recently found. Um, I like to tell folks, when I was running for um, the Senate in 15, one of the most distressing things I ever heard was someone say, oh, I'll vote for you if I'd be here, but I'm moving to North Carolina because that's where Advance is taking my job. Well, the, the question is, why is Advance Auto even in Roanoke? It's because that's where the founders lived. You know, we need to make it as easy as possible for folks to start a business and grow a business. And that's what Senator Stanley was just talking about with Homestead Creamery. I mean, it's, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that folks around the state talk about how much they enjoy Homestead uh, products and their kids really love it. And you know where that's from? That's from Franklin County. And that's just something that got started here. And, those are the sorts of programs that we need to focus on, are things that allow our own business, our own entre people become entrepreneurs, grow their businesses, and, and some of the McAuliffe model of, hey, you know, we really hope that this, you know, interesting car company will take off. Fortunately, it wasn't Virginia that was on the hook. I think that was the people down south that mm -hmm. lost a lot of money on that one. Uh, but it's a very different approach between 
you know, the conservative one that we have and the administrations. Uh, what about Go Virginia? We were talking a little bit about uh, regional cooperation. I, I, I think in your district and in, in your area, that's been going on quite well, but talk to us a little bit more about the opportunities that Go Virginia presents. I think Go Virginia uh, takes a regional approach and it also puts growth mostly in the hands of business leaders and businesses and entrepreneurs and small business in, in those regions rather than depending on the, the state government to make those decisions for for us. And I think, you know, I've always said, what well, you've heard it from me before, that, that politicians don't create jobs, but we can create the environment for jobs to grow and to occur. And so in that regard, I think Go Virginia puts into the hands of the regional leaders, the government leaders and business leaders, the opportunity to be thinking about education, research, infrastructure, job growth. And what we then do is fund uh, that program and then using the best and the brightest minds that we have in those regions that know what that region needs because a one-size-fit-all model doesn't work and we're learning that here in the General Assembly. But we put our trust into those people to do the right things in those areas and from that uh, those regions will grow in a way uh, that, that will be beneficial to their people now and in the future. What I find and I think David Suderland and I both find is it's amazing to me that partisanship has its place in the General Assembly but regionalism, that is, mm -hmm. Northern Virginia wrestling with us in Southside and Southwest, or Hampton Roads in a competition with Northern Virginia, that's really where the tussles are up here. And so, you know, we have been, you know, because of our shrinking populations and our growing district sizes, our voices, we have to speak louder. But Go Virginia empowers us in a way and puts on a level playing field where we can compete regionally with Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. It's a brilliant idea. I know we're talking about some budget cuts right now for the Go Virginia program, which is just in its infancy. I hope we find the way to keep that fully funded to help it grow, because it's going to be a boon to Southside and Southwest in the Roanoke Valley. Uh, let's talk a little bit about transportation. You serve on the Transportation Committee. You've been around here for at least seven or eight years because you were a legislative director for Senator Smith before you were elected to, to the Senate. How do you think the 2013 funding uh, has been implemented, especially in terms of the smart scale uh, objective criteria that is now used? Uh, well, the 2013 bill had, had several problems, especially for us geographically. Uh, and Senate Transportation, probably more than any other committee, is regionally focused. And, because you're prioritizing which projects and what kind of projects will help different parts of the Commonwealth. Um, the 2013 bill was especially problematic because it created special taxing uh, districts in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. And what that did was it allowed them to generate money on their own that they could then say, this is our money, we raised it through our own taxes. We still had our taxes raised in our part of the state, but what it did was when we now say we have this project uh, in Southside or Southwest and we think the state ought to support this significantly, Northern Virginia or Hampton Roads can come in with their alternative project and they're part of the state and say, we think we should do this and by the way, we're going to put this much money towards it. And whenever you balkanize the state taxing system like that, you, you hurt you hurt the system as a whole. And I think that was the wrong path to go down. Uh, transportation's been you know, something that we've been focused on for several years. Um, the Kane administration ended with us finding out that there was more money for transportation than they'd let on and they were closing rest areas and things like that, which was pretty terrible. Uh, but I don't think the 2013 bill was a good way to go uh, for our region or for the state as a whole. But it's what we have. And so I think ultimately we need to, to be learning how to play the game. You know, the smart scale, the problem, we're in the Salem uh, Transportation desk, District, yeah. It's one of the largest geographic districts. Think about it this way. Over the past 20 years, the Northern Virginia has gotten $6 billion, with a B, dollars in transportation money for new highway. Hampton Roads, four bill, over $4 billion. Salem District, $900 million. Our, and on the smart scale, and that shows where the jobs, the jobs follow where the new construction goes. But on the smart scale, the number one job, the transportation job that was funded, was a footbridge. A footbridge. A footbridge. We need things like Interstate 73. We had great roads and rail in the 50s and 60s. It just hasn't gone further, and we need to make sure that we're participating. So unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to fight fire with fire, and we're going to have to come up with some, uh, some ways that we can have Richmond fund our road system, have them fund 
our new construction for an interstate highway that will bring 53,000 jobs to our area. And, uh, and you know, at some point we've got to stop licking our paw and, uh, and do a woe is me. And we've got to be aggressive if we want to bring those jobs to the area because infrastructure matters most. Budget. We've got uh, a billion and a half uh, deficit yeah. to close, I just think. A, uh, just 1.5 billion. Uh, apparently there will be uh, pay raises for state employees, especially in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know whether teachers are going to get a pay raise. Talk to us about that, that particular budget item. Well, I think the Republican caucus and Dave and myself, we had put in a, a budget last year that would pay our uh, state police, would pay our deputy sheriffs. We have deputy sheriffs in our area that because of the, the number of children that they have, and the pay that they're receiving, qualify for public assistance. Qualify that, that, for public assistance. Public assistance. That cannot happen. So we dedicated ourselves to that. Unfortunately, they were tied to revenue generation, and we didn't hit the marks for them to get the raises. So our Republican caucus came back with a singular focus, which was to pay our state employees and to make sure that our deputy sheriffs are compensated and our state police. We're losing state police at a rate, at historical rates, and we're not replacing them. We need to keep the best and the brightest who keep us safe, who protect us, our children, our families, and our property. So what this new budget amendment does is it takes care of the state police, takes care of our state employees, and our deputy sheriffs. So I think we're on the right track. Um, we'll try to find and try to keep uh, what we can do for the teachers. But teachers are not state employees. They're local employees. Some of them got raises. Uh, but uh, let's try to make sure that we're also compensating them in the future. So to the extent that there are teacher raises, uh, generally speaking, that places a, a burden on local school districts because they have to come up with a match, I believe. That's often what the General Assembly pursues. But part of that is so they local employees, just like the uh, Bill said there, when you have localities that want to raise teacher pay but they don't actually want to pay for those increases, mm -hmm. it's not fair to the rest of the Commonwealth. And most localities have taken it on when they're given the opportunity of state matching funds to, to make the pay increase itself. Uh, my sister, who teaches just a little further west uh, of our two districts, um, her locality didn't, didn't match. And so I'd hear from her each year that they didn't match and why it was terrible. And I said, you know, that's something that your local folks need to decide if it's a priority for them. And she lives right there on the state line and so she's now teaching on the other side of the state line. It's important that we, uh, we pay our teachers a, a good ro ro wage, just like it is for everyone else to attract top talent. Um, but localities have a significant responsibility with that. And the Commonwealth certainly has done our part the last several years on it. It's just the localities would sometimes like more even though it's local employees. Well, great. We're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you both for being here, Senator Bill Stanley and Senator David Sutherland. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Wayne. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.